I think I represent some kind of a bridge between what I should frequently refer to as some time back and a sort of imaginary future which I should probably recommend uh, to you. Some time back I was present at a conversation taking place between a man um, who was a teacher of mine and a surveyor and a woman who had gone to engage his services in that role. And the woman said to him, Mr. Gibbons, I'd like you to measure up the land by Wednesday because I want to broadcast on Thursday. And since I had had some experience in London of radio, I suddenly got very curious about her relation to radio, only to discover that her broadcast had nothing to do with radio. And when I checked, I too discovered that broadcast was the old English word for the scattering of seed. She wanted to scatter her seed by Thursday. This association of culture and agriculture is therefore very interesting in her articulation because seed represents agriculture and broadcast is a cultural practice carried out by CBC and BBCs and such institutions. This place is um, called The Shed and I quite honestly don't quite recognize it because I'm looking at the word shed uh, through the eyes of my youth. There's an interesting development has taken place in Barbados, which, uh, as far as I know, is unique in that I don't think there's any other place in the world of such small size and such huge social distances within that size. Extraordinary distances. And I mention that because there's a fascinating closure of that distance when I think of what this location was or used to be and those who are our hosts. There could be no greater social distance than the museum and the shed when I was a boy. Now, the shed resonates, or I want it to resonate, I'm not sure it does. It resonates with some very important political and historical moments in Barbados and this region. It is not only here where a significant part of what is called the agricultural exhibition took place, and in those days, they used to exhibit pigeons and rabbits as part of the agricultural uh, practice. But it was very famous for dances. There are two areas in this space called the park where you danced. One was next door, which I gather is no longer in service. And the shed. And the shed was where working class people held their dances because they could not hold dances in the building next door. This was essentially a working class location for recreation and particularly for dances on Friday or Saturday nights. 
and I listen to commentaries these days about dance methods. And I was not allowed to come to the shed as a boy, but one might get there somehow or other. And I have seen in the shed, I now recall, there was a kind of dancing, mainly by the women, um, which today um, it's called and called uh, with some regret, waka. The, the shared dancing of the 1940s and 50s was waka. But the difference between these two was that the women, and the women were most expert at this, there may have been a greater curvature of spine, I don't know, but there was no suggestion whatsoever of sexual simulation in wakap. Wakap was a form of dance, and, and quite often the women danced together. It is likely that the men may have had some difficulty with that curvature of spine. But the shed was also the place where critical political meetings took place. The shed played the role which today Independence Square now plays. That is, whenever the late Grantley Adams, who was then the leading figure of his time, when Adams was going to speak, he spoke from the shed. And Barbadians of the time were very afraid of rain. There was a superstition that if it hit the mold of the head, something happened to the brain. People didn't usually go out in rain except Adams was speaking in the shed. I have never seen since, including leaders, anyone who attracted an audience of such size and of such what appeared to be collective affection of that time as Grantley Adams. It was also the location. This was the location which Marcus Garvey paused on his way through to Jamaica after deportation to say a few words before he arrived at home. And it was the place from which messages went that triggered the events of 1937. It was also within this space that the Mine Commission, there's a generation who may not know after the riots, they sent some people out to find out what had happened and why did people behave so badly and so on. And this was very fascinating because what the commission did was the commission put up loudspeakers all around the park and they, in a way, investigated the personnel, the various authorities people like the bishop and people, the heads of institutions. And they put up the microphones because they wanted the crowd within the shed to hear the answers. And the shed often interrupted by saying, not true, not true, not true, not true. So we are, in a way, in not the shadow, but in a sight, the delayed illumination of a very remarkable location. But I deal, as you know, with language that is largely my business. And uh, one of the things one is most struck by is the way the language we use changes, the way its, its meaning changes from century to century, the way particular words change their meaning. I often draw to students' attention the one that I find sometimes not so amusing but very apt 
is to ask, when you hear the word revolution, what do you think of? And immediately everyone thinks of upheaval, dismantling, overthrowing. And this is the very opposite of what the word originally meant. The earliest meaning of the word revolution was a harmonious movement around a fixed point. It's about the 15th or 16th century. 1789 decided that the movement would not be so harmonious because the French did not like revolving around a harmonious point. The same thing is happening, um, in a way, uh, with culture, that it has had a great variety of meanings. And I shall start, of course, with the first. But before I go on to culture and its specific meaning, I want to remind you that much of the world that I am evoking, much of the articulation that I am offering by way of interpretation, takes place within a context of power. And the power that I am thinking of is the power whose legacy, in a way, is still with us, and certainly a power which my generation felt very directly. And that is that from 1814, from 1814 to 1915, that was the beginning of the second, uh, of the first civil war in Europe, from 1814, to 1950, European power, as is its colonial power, European power expanded from 35% to 85% of the planet. That is, in my time, 85% of the planet was literally ruled organized by France and England and other European powers. And it is out of that particular background that many of us have been shaped. The original meaning of the word culture, the very earliest that it comes into the language somewhere about the beginning of the 16th century. The original meaning had to do with the tending of plants and the care of animals. That's its earliest meaning. Men and women living at the time, when they said culture, that is what they meant. The caring, the tending of plants and the caring of animals. In other words, this word and the process it describes has its roots in the practice of agriculture. And it has never lost this sense of nurturing, of feeding, of cultivating, whether it be a body or a mind that is under consideration. The first and essential meaning of culture is therefore the means whereby men and women feed themselves, clothe and shelter themselves. The means whereby they achieve and reproduce their material existence. No food, no life. No food, no book. No food, no religion. No food, no philosophy. No food, no politics. No food, no performing arts because no one is exempt from the demands of the material life. And so we need to understand, therefore, why the farmer and the fisherman 
our cultural workers. And that all questions, all questions relating to the process of social transformation are cultural questions. And secondly, we mean by culture the variety of ways in which men and women interpret and translate through the imagination the meaning of that material existence in the light of their concrete experience. That is religion, or philosophy, art, and the institutions which mediate their daily lives. All these, the religion, the philosophy, the art, are influenced in one way or another by the circumstances of our material existence. And the characteristic of our history in the Caribbean has been the continuing constraints which have been placed on the power to exercise sovereignty and on our freedom for self-definition. And if there is one area in which we can identify the neglect, even the abandonment of cultural sovereignty, it is in the area of food production. The Caribbean is a most fertile sea and we occupy lands, taking the whole region into consideration, which accommodate a great variety of crops. It is a region with the distinct potential for meeting the basic food needs, basic, I repeat, of the Caribbean people and yet the Caribbean Commonwealth, that's the English-speaking corner of the Caribbean, in the year 1985-86, was spending $700 million a year on imported food. Today, it has gone to $900 million in that period of time. There is a crisis in cultural sovereignty when patterns of consumption bear little relation to basic needs and cannot be supported by the productive base of the society. A minister of culture in our region, whether he knows it or not, is engaged in what is essentially a cultural problem. The Minister of Agriculture is engaged in essentially a cultural problem. And the problem is how do you decolonize the eating habits of a people who have surrendered their very palates to foreign control? The synonym of breakfast is Kellogg's. In these circumstances, it is almost wicked to arouse and titillate the labor and expectations of local farmers to engage in a rivalry with imported food on the scale of 900 million a year. But it is not only the local farmer who experiences this assault on his struggle for sovereignty, the native actor, the native dancer, the writer, the musician, all these who strive for an authentic definition of themselves and their society are in much the same position as the local farmer. They're condemned to a hopeless struggle against the massive insult of imported television. It is not only imported, it is actually the garbage of another world and loaded on a mesmerized and uncritical uh, populist. Basic leadership is innocent if it does not recognize that the mass production of culture in this form is intended to ensure and reinforce the underdevelopment of their people. 
There is also a sense in which the fisherman and the farmer may be regarded as cultural workers in their own right. Social practice has provided them with a considerable body of knowledge and the capacity to make discriminating judgments in their daily work. And if we do not regard them as cultural and intellectual workers in their own right, it's largely, I think, because of the social stratification which is created by the division of labor and the legacy of an education system which is designed to reinforce such a division in our modes of perceiving social reality. But there are cultural workers in their own right. And I'm going to prevent you with one example of the evidence for that by taking a look at Professor Woodward Marfield's notes on the peasant developments since 1838. He's writing in 1968. Peasant activity modified the character of the original plantation economy and society. Peasant workers. Peasant workers were the innovators in the economic life of the community, besides producing a greater quality and variety of subsistence food and livestock. They introduced new crops and or reintroduced old ones. The peasants initiated the conversion of those plantation territories into modern societies. And in a variety of ways, they attempted to build local self-generating communities. They founded villages and markets. They built churches and schools. They clamored for extension of educational facilities for improvements in communication and markets, they started the local cooperative movement. Peasant development was emancipation in action. This is an achievement of cultural activity of the highest possible order. But we cannot see it that way because we have been trained to locate such people in an entirely different order of social evaluation. I want to draw uh, two portraits of attempts at feeding yourself and going back now into the past, very much, very far back, um, in a context whose major characteristic um, is scarcity. I did one of which is the rural area and the other urban. And there is a sense in which um, this is autobiographical, meaning that what I'm describing here, I saw. I was present as a boy watching what was happening here. And the, I can identify it. I have to be very careful with identifying. I do not know what the laws are about identifying. But I can assure you that you will not get any damages from this source. So there's no point pursuing it. Um, there was a, I was going to say an old man. It is very interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm recalling something when I'm probably 12, 14, I think. And this is taking place in the area that is known as St. David's. Um, and the, the man I'm talking about, um, whom I say is an old man, um, he would have been about 70. And 70 in the 1940s to 
a 10 or 12 year old was very old in him. Although he was much younger than I am, he was certainly very old, a 14 year old boy at that time. And he had a, a little patch of land. Um, it was not any bigger than perhaps the area of this hall, perhaps a, a little smaller than this. And that is, it ran off from the house. There was a house looking onto the road, and then that patch of land ran out. I think about half, not rooms. But on this, um, I want to identify the number of crops that he brought out of that land. The power of sugar was so great that although the area was small and he intended to feed himself off the land, he first of all put everything in sugar. If, so from one end to the next, uh, sugar went right across the land. His problem then is how do we deal with the sugar if we're going to get some food? And this is how uh, he dealt um, with the sugar. First, he started a fence. He started a fence, um, growing the fence on every side, right around. Uh, now, this fence was not a fence of wood. It was not a fence of corrugated iron. It, it was what you would call a natural fence. It was a fence of cucumber vines. Now, these cucumber vines running all around. Uh, and rising above the cucumber vine were these leaves of these swollen pods of green peas. He had the cucumber vines went around, right around, with the cucumbers hanging down. And then above the cucumber vines, uh, you had these green peas going right around to the back, right around, right around. So we had there, you might say, three crops. He had a sugar crop, he had green peas, and he had cucumbers. Then there was a little gate uh, in one fence, um, because the sugar is a bit thick, and you can't really see very much when you walk through them, but he is inviting you uh, uh, to see what else is there. And when he tells you to look down, yes, what you look, you're looking at another vine that rambles, this vine now rambles like snakes all through the roots of the sugar cane. And it's a pumpkin vine. And this pumpkin will feed the children in a whole street for weeks on end until the harvest is over. And that's crop number four. The fifth is not too difficult to detect if you find your way through the canes. There are two or three rows of, these are very fragile very fragile trees with prickly pods, uh, dried, very dry these pods, and they're scarlet, and uh, they're elevated to a certain status, uh, this particular uh, pods, it's a little tree, um, and it grows a sorrel, uh, which then, uh, in those days, was associated exclusively with Christmas. There have been very great changes in this relation of, of food and ritual. Uh, nobody in his right mind would drink sorrel in April or May, because sorrel was a December drink. You didn't drink sorrel in April or May. Just as when I was a boy, you did not eat cuckoo except on Saturdays. It was not a Wednesday or a Thursday or a Tuesday meal within that dream. It was a very fascinating correlation of eating as a ritual and the occasions when you would eat that ritual. The fifth crop is perhaps the most important uh, for it's highly questionable whether the islands of the British Caribbean would be inhabited today were it not for the irreplaceable breadfruit. The little farmer, my little farmer, he had 
uh, two of these trees with an annual produce of three suppers a week for a family of five. This is how he calculated it. And the breadfruit, uh, you probably know, the breadfruit was, was, it's difficult for Barbarians to believe this, that the breadfruit was really brought in here. The breadfruit comes from a long, long way away. Um, and it was brought in by a man called Bly, uh, who I think regretted that he did bring it in. Um, <laughs> Because it was originally brought in uh, mainly uh, as slave food, but even more important, it was brought in to feed the pigs. Now, it was very interesting for those of you who are interested in what is called research to find out, to trace uh, what one may call the elevation, as it were, of the breadfruit from pig food and food of slaves to what I gather is now served in very prestigious restaurants as chips. There are breadfruit chips uh, with a variety of flavors. It's a long journey from pig food to chips. That's a very, very long journey and I don't think it should be allowed to pass without some historical record of the travail it may have had during that period. Um, I was told that these are anecdotal. I, when I was a little bigger and got very curious, and I was asking when, when did decent people start to eat breadfruit and, um, Oh, I was told, or oh, the rumor went out that the governor was eating breadfruit. He had breadfruit for breakfast. Now, during the colonial period, um, it's very difficult for a certain generation to grasp the enormous prestige and reverence and so on, uh, which surrounded a governor. Now, if breadfruit had got to the governor's table, there was no layer of the society got good from on breadfruit. I don't know if the governor actually had breadfruit, but breadfruit became was not only popular among the lower classes, but as I say, it became uh, very elevated. Um, now, there was another uh, crop, if you went on at a very respectable um, distance, as a very purple, and green, very delectable fruit, and, and this really was the farmer's pride. I do not know if you, I'm sure you have not registered it as very serious of the status of plants, the status of, of fruit, because the other plant was, was really a pear tree, that's, that's what you call the avocado, and that was, uh, that was that was really a farmer's pride if you, if you had pear trees. Uh, and his pear tree was about the, the sixth crop. Now, you could, um, you, could, you could beg for a breadfruit. He probably would give you a breadfruit. And you could, um, you could probably um, pick a cucumber. If he wasn't looking, he wouldn't make too much fuss about that. But any raid at all on, on the pear tree would be a matter for the police. They did not belong to the same category. Uh, the pear tree and the breadfruit tree, these are polarities and so on. The whole lot of other things are in between. Well, Barbadians are thought to be conservative. I don't share that view. They're among the most aggressive people I've ever come across, and I have traveled a great deal. But it's a, it's a kind of, um, it's a suppressed aggression. If you notice, they have trouble with teeth. Um, they don't believe in too much demonstration of anger. It's, 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 it's pressed on. It's, it's, it's kept inside. And that, that apparent quiet which 
are people called conservative, I don't think it's very conservative at all, and you only have to run into the Barbados outside of Barbados in a certain situation to realize that he's far from being conservative. But what it is is uh, um, what one would describe as an excess of caution. It's extremely cautious. That is that he does not leap and wonder what will happen. No, no, no. Trinidadians do that. Trinidadians will say, let's do a thing. Let's do a thing and find out what happens. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But doing a thing. Well. The Barbadian is not given to doing a thing. He watches, he calculates, and when he moves, he has to be reasonably sure that there's no disaster at the end of this. There might not be the triumph he was looking for, but there certainly must be uh, no disaster at the end of this. It's extremely cautious, uh, not uh, conservative. Um. Now, I think that's about the sixth or seventh uh, uh, crop. Uh, what I'm saying is that here within this context of, of scarcity, um, you have uh, what you call a simple man, but not so simple, who have devised a way uh, of feeding himself. And in the process of doing that, therefore, when you think of the size of the plot, this almost uh, human coalition between a man's hands and the earth he plows, which creates a wholly new set of feelings uh, uh, towards the land. It's five, six, seven crops just uh, on this area. One of the purposes of this series, I believe, in which the historians and so on will deal with, was the phases through which people went in trying to, to feed themselves. Um, and that's an example of what I mean. It's acute, acute uh, scarcity. We will come to the reasons for that scarcity very right soon. That's the rural example. But there is a, what I would call a an urban example, and I'm speaking of a man who was, in fact, my, my godfather, who lived in Carrington's village, and he, he didn't have any plot. His house was on a lot, and he had a yard. And he had the yard. And he was, by trait, he belonged to that second layer of the uh, field labor and so on. He was a cooper. He was a member of that um, artisan class, and so on. But what he kept uh, uh, in, in that yard uh, were goats. He had a great passion uh, for goats. And I got very attached to him because he always wanted me to, to take the goats out to graze the goats. And I had noticed, um, I don't remember how old I was, that um, the goats had no sense of family relations at all. And I enjoyed taking the goats out because the goats had great fun. Uh, and I would sometimes get someone to come with me to watch the goats grazing and doing other things than grazing. Now, it sometimes raced the goats, uh, but uh, the old man, uh, he would know what else we did. But what I was fascinated by, not only the goats, uh, that made me later record this, uh, but he also kept uh, pigeons. He had a great fancy for pigeons. And he, um, he fed the pigeons out of his hand. He had the corn, he made some kind of noise in the morning, and the pigeons came, he would throw some there, and then keep the rest here in both hands, and the pigeons would eat out of his hand. He also kept a duck or two at the, 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 the goats. And at 5 o'clock, uh, which was that 5 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, early evening at 5 o'clock, which was sort of feeding time, he would uh, seem to understand this language. About 5 o'clock, he went out into the yard with the coin and just said, come, come. And these, these pigeons would circle. Uh, they would circle and circle, just circle the roof 
until they came right down to the hands, until the hands were covered then uh, with feathers. And uh, they ate uh, from uh, his hand uh, this corn. This is the urban uh, connection to how do you, in the context of scarcity, feed yourself. What is noticeable here is that the one with the crops owned, he was the owner, this is the critical. The one with the crops who grew his five and six crops, he owned that land. And you could tell also um, that they radiated a kind of, of security and a kind of safety. The urban example, who was very strong and very independent, uh, was a tenant and showed, in a way, the signs that go with knowing or not knowing uh, when you may have uh, to leave. The very early one became very aware of the extraordinary importance of property. And that is why it plays such a critical role in the law. I'm not too sure which comes first, but people who look at the laws will notice that the law is very, very, very careful. The law places a very high priority on the protection and the defense of property. I sometimes am not too sure which comes first, protecting life or protecting property. If you notice sometimes in courts, I read the court cases sometimes and you would find that um, a man um, who's beaten a woman, which is a violence that could lead to death, so, would be fined. Or rather, no, yes, yes, he would be fined. He would be fined. But if a man went down and stole something from Cave Shepherd, he went to jail. You, di you didn't find him. It, it's as though the punishment for theft had to be much, much more severe than the punishment for violence that might have led uh, to death. The reason for that scarcity has to do, of course, with land use. You will hear more about that from other speakers. I just want to draw to your attention what seemed the extraordinary disproportions that took place uh, in the society. Um, the late Colin Hudson, a marvelous man uh, and a geographer, has left us uh, um, wonderful examples of, of land use uh, in Barbados. Well, I was editing a journal in the 1990s and uh, got him to write a piece that calls these, these fields and hills. And in which I will just give you a brief example of the, the kind of situations he is drawing to our attention. Um, he says that uh, when um, um, the first settlers came to, to Barbados, uh, there was something like 74,000 acres of arable land and so on. Um, apparently, they, they were very barbarous. They, they cut down a lot of the trees, right? They made a mess, he said, a terrible mess. But for the next uh, 200 years and so on, they uh, tended to uh, preserve it. And this is the, I find, a very fascinating uh, uh, breakdown. That when they came, say, this is the 17th century, uh, there were 74,000 acres of arable land that could be managed. That was in 17, uh, that was in around 1630, 1640. Now, um, by the, uh, during the war, that we call the Second uh, uh, 
World War, um, they had 66,000 acres of that land. That means that they had lost only 8,000. They lost 8,000 between the 17th century and 1945. Now, this is what he finds now alarming. Um, they, you move from 74,000 acres in the 17th century to 66,000, that's only 8,000 different, uh, by 1950. But in 1986, that had dropped to 44,000 by 1986. Uh, in other words, what had happened was that you had lost the loss was three times greater in the last 36 years than overall in the previous 323 years. In the last 36 years, it's three times the loss of the land. The question you might ask is, what happened? We say lost. Who stole the land? How did land get lost? That in a question of 36 years, you lost the arable land that lost three times more than in the previous 300 years. Um, that was in 1986. Um, now, I was mentioning this to um, a very remarkable scholar who is not himself in the land business, but. Uh, um, who was very aware of what was happening, and I was asking him, how, how many acres do you think there is now? I don't know, there are probably people here who would know the figure. Um, but he told me he doubted that there could be 20,000, and wouldn't put it beyond 18. That's a, that, he wouldn't put it beyond 18, but it could be about 80, between 18 and 20,000 of Arab land. Uh, we have no doubt what, uh, when you look around at the, the extraordinary changes that have taken place um, around the various coasts of Barbados, there's a sense in which uh, whatever um, was the island is rapidly um, disappearing. To move from the land, I wanted to, uh, thank you. Pardon my watch. To give some idea of the, what I would call the, the social formations um, that have really emerged um, uh, from that situation. Some years ago, um, I was addressing um, the 40th Annual Conference of the Barbados Workers' Union, and I was trying to look at the, the portrait of um, a minister of government, whom I had called the Honorable Member. Um, uh, and what I was trying to do there was to give them some um, idea of what, um, in inverted commas, uh, independence had done uh, for certain people. Um, the man I was looking at, he was about um, um, he was about 40, and he um, was born in, in humble, what they call humble circumstances. Um, had gone on scholarship to secondary schools and universities, and he uh, became a lawyer, um, had a passing interest in economics, and then uh, a godfather persuaded him uh, to go into to politics. He had a very moderate success at the bar, um, but he did go into politics, contested an election, and, and he won. And this is uh, the man I was looking at. He served as a minister of government. He's represented his country in various international negotiations. Today, he owns three houses and a chicken farm. 
There is also a substantial rumor of investment in an auxiliary transport service locally known as the minibus and shares in various tourist resorts. His known assets are estimated to be in the region of a figure not under one and a quarter million dollars. He occupies a large four-bedroom house in the rural suburbs with an ample view of six parishes and a horizon of sky that disappears into the deep water harbor. His tastes have been influenced by foreign travel. The furniture is modern Scandinavian. There is a conspicuous assortment of Moroccan rugs, exquisitely patterned in crimson and gold. These were acquired as a gift after a brief romance in southern Spain. The walls on all sides are disfigured by juvenile souvenirs of illuminated nights in New York, eating out along the bay in San Francisco, racially mixed clubs at play around the kidney-shaped swimming pool uh, in Miami. Many contemporaries and so on had a privilege of schooling similar to his. They may have been enterprising, but They've all made notable contributions to education and the upper levels of the civil service. Some have been chairman of corporate functionaries in development banks, one kind or another, and a few in general medical practice. The point I'm making out here is none of that generation, none of his acquaintance went into business. I was very interested in following then what I do, this character constructed of what I call this formation, this, this tremendously powerful, conspicuously powerful, as you hear, man. Who was his great-grandfather? His great-grandfather was born in the parish of St. George in 1877, the year after the Confederation riots. He was put out to labor as an estate hand at the age of nine, and 12 years later, an ox crippled him for life. He lingered until the age of 40, elaborating on the stories he'd heard in childhood about the great insurrection, which had engaged a turbulent underclass of workers against elements of the merchant and planter class. The honorable member would not have known him. His grandfather, who was born in 1894, continued to pass on his father's recollections of these confederation rats. It made him, this is very interesting, we had a governor there at this time called Hennessy. Um, his grandfather, who was born in Nanivo, continued to pass on the father's recollections of confederation rats. And he could never understand why Governor Hennessy should have included in his famous six points the outrageous proposal that the Mendel Asylum in Barbados should open its doors to receive lunatics from other islands. This was caused a great stir, and there was a suggestion that you might take. There's some very interesting block here that people who were mentally ill in St. or St. Lucia, you couldn't really deal with that as though it was some sort of contagion. But I was very, very careful and very conscious about uh, what forms of human creature cross its borders. Um, not long ago, um, a number of Haitians were picked up dead. There were corpses that were picked up a few years back, and the question was what to do with them. And they were actually found in Barbados waters and so on, and there was a tremendous discussion among the politicians because, in fact, a considerable portion of the Barbados population said that they would not bury any foreign dead. They did not want any foreign bodies, any foreign corpses. Uh, uh, buried in Barbados. And this is exactly uh, the case with Hennessy and, um, and the, uh, the mental asylum. This uh, young man, the, uh, who, uh, as I said, um, uh, the grandfather uh, coming off, what I'm showing is this, what the grandfather is going to be the key one, because the grandfather who distinguished himself as a cooper uh, made sort of excellent casks um, 
made chairs, it was very technical, and was really the beginning of that artisan class. And it is that class, that uh, field labor moving into artisan class, it is that artisan class that would then um, invest very heavily education, 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 education. Yeah. These were men who were cultivated immense pride in the excellent quality of the things they made. Um, but the simple ambition now was that the other generation uh, must be educated. So the honorable member will have to remember him, but it was the grandfather who preached the absolute necessity of education. And he perceived the school as the only possible means of rescuing his offspring from the humiliation his ancestors had enjoyed. The book, the lesson, pen and ink, these were his images of redemption. And that's why his son, the honorable member's father, born in 1914, was destined to be a teacher. The elementary school became their chapel, Harson College their cathedral, and an English university, the kingdom of heaven. That was the structure at the time, and it is not such a a long uh, ago a time, uh, these systems don't just collapse like that. They don't wither um, away. I want to come to a close. I may have gone on a little too long. Uh, I touched briefly on, uh, on the question of food. Uh, um, shan't be long on this. Uh, I was trying to read up about eating, and I mean about this human creature uh, eating, and I found some very odd things, um, at least the things I mean are odd, that for 10 or 1,000 years and so on, that we ate more or less the same thing, that food never changed. And that is, that it, it, it was one vegetable and something else, some savory, just a vegetable and savory, a vegetable and savory, a vegetable and savory for thousands of years, a vegetable and celery. And I had a, a friend recently come to me and I, I was wanting to find out, how, how do you eat? I wanted to find out whether this thing had persisted. That there is something that when you, when you ate, you had a carbohydrate, you had some sort of vegetable, but then there had to be, had to be something without it. And the test I thought was, uh, I asked him, uh, tell me something, Suppose your wife brought you a plate, just with the plain cornmeal cuckoo, nothing else, just the cuckoo. I said, I mean just the cuckoo. I said, just the cuckoo, you know, you took her out and she put the cuckoo on the plate and she brought you the plate. I said, but you can't eat cuckoo by itself. You can't eat cuckoo by itself. I said, what, what do you mean by it? It said, hey, there's something, there's a piece of fish, or there's a piece of meat, or there's a piece. You can't eat cuckoo by itself. And this is exactly what it being said 10,000 years ago, that the vegetable must also and always have a savory. For thousands of years, the human creature would not have a vegetable without a savory. Not only in 1080, but apparently in 2014, you are not going to eat cuckoo without some kind of savory. But food uh, is not, um, I want to emphasize, food is not exclusively a, a nutritional act. It also serves a social purpose. Uh, what we eat and how we eat and whom we eat with may tell us something about ourselves and our relation to others. The pioneering anthropologist Robertson Smith observed among societies he had studied, and I quote, those who sit at meal together are united for all social effects. Those who do not eat together are alien uh, to one another and without reciprocal uh, duties. It's a very interesting 
observation that one makes as this business, I do not know, if you're eating sometimes, you're too busy eating to notice what is happening when you are eating. But, um, for example, uh, um, when people eat together, if people are eating together a meal, there is a, a, a greater relaxation. Um, the individual um, eating alone uh, is likely to be d dealing with some kind of tension. It's a very social quality, not only nutritional, uh, to eating. And um, there used to be, I don't know why, but when I was a boy, whenever in our village you were going to eat, they told you to close the window. I do. Close the window. Apparently, it was nobody's business what we cooked. But you close the window when you are eating. close the window. And they're very interesting. The late Kathleen uh, Drayton's daughter was telling her had a problem at Queen's College because at lunchtime, um, she ran into this question of whom she would eat with. The girls at lunchtime at in groups. And you knew who were friends. That, that one group was over there and one group was over there. And these groups were in fact defined by complexion. Now she had grown up in what you would call a very progressive house and didn't observe these rules. And she got into some difficulty because she found herself with the wrong group. And then the other group said, look, if you're, if you're with them, don't come here, and so on. So even at school, and where in fact the faculty knew this, there was this institutionalization of whom did you eat with? I do not know um, whether you consider it uh, a code that you yourself follow, I suspect that you do, uh, of you think very carefully about whom you are going to eat with. You think very carefully about who is coming uh, to eat. I'm coming finally, this is the second time I've said finally. Um, to the commodity that has meant so much to us. There was a man called uh, Sir Dolby Thomas, this is back in the 17th century, who was also governor of Jamaica uh, and who was a great promoter, really, of, of sugar. What I don't, I never realized until I started reading about sugar. Uh, that it started off as a very great luxury. Uh, in the 17th century uh, in England, uh, sugar would have been eaten only by the nobility and by the, the very rich. Only the nobility and the rich. And one of the questions that, uh, that historians are trying to ask, or from time to time try to ask, is how, what time and, uh, and how did sugar then become so popular among uh, the working classes? In the 18th century, we have that uh, sugar is extraordinarily uh, uh, popular. The poor are, are eating sugar. And sugar, as uh, Williams has let us know, was a source of enormous uh, capital. I have an interesting uh, passage by the philosopher John Stuart Mill uh, on this extraordinary man of such enormous intellect. And you would think also of imagination, um, would be thinking the way he did about colonies, and sure, particularly sugar colonies. You know, Locke said that uh, he was commenting on sugar, uh, and he says, you know, 
or Western, that is the West Indian colonies, it cannot be regarded as countries with a productive capital of their own, but rather the places where England finds it convenient to carry on the production of sugar and other tropical commodities. What he's saying really is that there is little production of anything except for staple commodities, and these are sent to England not to be exchanged for things uh, exported to the colony and consumed by its inhabitants, but to be sold in England for the benefit of, of proprietors there. The trade with the West Indies is hardly to be considered an external trade, but more resembles the traffic between tongue and country. But then it's quite extraordinary that what, what Stuart Mill is saying is that, look, sending trade, sending commodities, or having commodities sent from a place like Barbados to Liverpool, that is no foreign trade. It's like sending something from the, from the country to the town. In other words, uh, from Liverpool to Barbados should be treated the same as from St. Lucy to Bridgetown. One of the most extraordinary minds of his time sees this other exists simply as an extension and a convenient um, extension um, of itself. We are reminded, uh, or were reminded, of the necessity of the poor for sugar. Sugar became everybody at sugar. Everybody wanted sugar became a, not only the, uh, it ceased to be luxury now, but became a daily necessity among the poorest. And the answer, why? Why did this happen? As to no other known commodity. This fascination, this unique fascination, and this desire for sugar. Why did this happen? And the answer is to be found, I think, in one word, sweetness. That is the sucrose extracted from the cane we call sugar. There is no meal from which it is excluded in any culture. There is no known culture which rejects the sucrose extracted from the cane we call sugar. It lends itself to every experimental concoction. In doubt or trouble, we say, put a pinch of sugar. It is the most ubiquitous and the most promiscuous of any food we consume. And the word has even penetrated our daily conversation. Women refer to a man as my sugar daddy. And um, some men refer to women simply as sugar. But it graces, it graces the literature of the 17th century. And you all, if you keep in touch with these things, will probably recognize these words. Barbantio um, is apologizing to Othello because he accuses Othello of stealing his daughter. He came here on this moor, this mercenary and so on, and he ran off with my daughter. And the daughter has to tell her father, I'm sorry you're wrong. He didn't steal me. There was no theft and he is making the apology to him. These sentences to sugar or to gall being strong on both sides are equivocal, but words are words. I never yet did hear 
that the bruised heart was pierced through the air. Thank you.